and um, but I don't I don't we're, we're seeing my screen so yeah I haven't shared anything yet. all right perfect so, yeah. so let's get started folks Michael Lafito here welcome to the 17th luxury lunch and learn I'm really excited about today's guest you know we use a lot of visuals I've been starting to use visuals and I've received some great feedback um, and constructive criticism as well and um, so we're always trying to uh, bring better content better value and use good visuals to hammer home points and today's guest I'm really excited about uh, today we're going to be talking about basically uh, the economy as well as real estate and 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 a lot of predictors as to you know how the bounce back and how it's different today than perhaps 2007 2008 and um, one of the things in, in the past if you've watched my trainings I've used some strong visuals and one of those visuals is the the effect of supply and demand and, and real estate what it does for appreciation and, and home prices uh, steady values or depreciating uh, house values and uh, we get those uh, visuals straight from keeping current matters um, and so that's actually who we have on today um, so before I introduce today's guest just a reminder every Monday Wednesday Friday same time same place you can go to uh, luxurylunchandlearn.com luxurylunchandlearn.com to sign up for the next availability so Wednesdays uh, we're supposed to have a gentleman on David Osborne he rescheduled so uh, right now, we're, uh, we're going to get another guest for Wednesday, um, but you can go on Luxury Lunch and Learn. We have a little thumbnail of who our scheduled guests are. So without further ado, um, I have David Childers on from uh, Keeping Current Matters. Uh, they provide amazing information for those in the real estate industry. And uh, with that, David, welcome. Hey, thank you, Michael. I'm excited to be on today. And you know, we've, we've done it before, uh, several months back and, and talked and just excited to talk about, you know, where this market is going. And even, you know, right now for us, while we've all been through the last couple of months of, of everything going on across the country, I'm starting to say, okay, what's, what's going to happen? What, where, where are we moving towards in the real estate market? So excited. Thanks for joining me. For, yeah, for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. So previously we had you on our podcast, yeah. obviously podcasts uh, get a lot of downloads, a lot of feedback. There's more and more people doing podcasts with COVID-19, but uh, particular, I think with your product in particular, uh, strong visuals are important. So uh, you're actually going to, I'm going to let you share your screen and it's going to almost be like an interactive webinar. Yeah. So again, if anybody has questions for David or myself, if you're watching this through the live stream, my assistant's checking the various live streams. So type in uh, your questions that you have. There's five major questions that uh, David's going to answer and back it up with good statistical data. And um, so with that being said, David, uh, if you want to um, show me your screen and yeah, I, I can share here. We can, we can start kind of that. Uh, uh, let's go in and maybe review the questions. I'll share my yes, screen absolutely. here so the, quick. Yeah. So the five questions that we're going to cover today is when is the economy going to recover? Uh, fair question, obviously. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. You can see them right in front of us. Yeah. When's the economy going to recover? Is this going to be like 2008 all over again? That's a common question that we asked uh, our previous guest. You know, how do you think, uh, you know, this differs from 20, uh, 2008? Uh, what about all those job losses? What's the biggest threat and what do you need to do right now? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, let's, let's, let's kind of take those each one and maybe we'll do this, Michael, maybe we'll talk about one and then I'll, I'll pause sharing the screen and some of the, the visuals that we have. We can, we can talk a little bit about it, maybe hop into the next one and if we get any questions, certainly don't hesitate to interrupt me and, uh, and we'll talk about that. Sound good? Yeah, no, that sounds good. And we're going to make these uh, slides available to, uh, to the viewers afterwards. So, you know, don't worry about taking notes or screenshots, that sort of thing. We are going to make these available. Thank, thanks to our friends at Keeping Current Matters. So um, let's do that. Let's do one by one. And, um, and then if we'll have questions, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know what those are. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Right. So let's start with this first question. When is the economy going to recover? And I think that's a question on a lot of our minds right now. And, you know, I, I mentioned before we've, you know, now that we're at the middle of May, we uh, across the country started this, depending on where, where you live sometime in March, maybe, you know, as we first or second week in March, middle of March and uh, largely for the last two months have been, 
in the middle of, uh, of, of everything that we now know looking back, this pandemic of coronavirus and everything. And, and hopefully now we're at a point where, you know, different places, different, you know, depending on where you're at in the country, we can start to look forward to say, okay, what is, um, you know, the economy going to look like? Nobody has a crystal ball, but we can certainly look at what experts are, are saying is on the horizon relative to recovery. Um, and so what I want to do maybe for the next few minutes is, bring in some quotes, bring in some expert forecasts, bring in some different things that'll help us to make sense of this market. And then ultimately, uh, things that we can share with um, people that we're doing business with right now as they have these questions. So that'd be my hope, is that everything that you and I talk about, Michael, the people listening to this today could take and use. And like you said, Michael, uh, they can get all the slides from you. We're gonna give all those to you. So they can use them uh, as they're communicating with people. So with that as kind of a backdrop, we'll hop in on this question, when is the economy gonna recover? And, I, and I'm gonna start out here with a, a quote from a CEO that I pulled, um, Michelle Buck, and she says, while comparisons can certainly be drawn to weather-related disruptions or natural disasters or recessions, the reality is we have never seen so many factors at play at the same time on such a global scale. So when you think about this, Michael, from an economic perspective, we've got all of these factors at play and economists are usually used to dealing with the business science, really looking at, you know, past things like Michelle mentions here uh, and saying, how's the economy reacted? But I would offer that this time it's very different in that there are probably three different sciences that economists are having to work with. As you know, as we look at this question of when the economy is going to recover, the first is the business science, and that's how's the economy rebounded from similar slowdowns that have happened in the past. And just like the quote mentioned, looking at similar, you know, pandemics or epidemics or you know weather-related uh, uh, disasters that maybe mirror some things that, that we see in the economy, but but now they're having to layer on top of the business science, the health science, meaning when. When will COVID-19 be under control? When do we get to that point where we know we're on the other side or downswing of it? And will there be another flare up once, once we get there, you know, in the virus this fall? And so they, they've got to take that into account as they're making uh, forward looking forecast. And, and third, there's a people science. And the people science is after the businesses are fully operational, how long will it take American consumers to return to normal consumption patterns? You know, going to a movie, attending a sporting event or flying. And there are a lot of, a lot of things that we know, uh, you know, people are saying, hey, this is not going to happen until we get uh, a vaccine or I feel comfortable doing this or different states opening up at different times. So a lot, a lot of questions to be answered in this area. But let's take a quick look at what major financial institutions are calling for relative to recovery. This is a graph right here showing five major financial institutions and them calling for recovery in the second half of the year. So if you look at this, you see, you know, we're looking at Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America. And this is a, this is a graphical representation of their forecast for GDP, which is the measure of economic activity in this country. And we know the first quarter GDP constricted, uh, the initial uh, advanced estimate came in at negative 4.8, and then here in the second quarter, we're expected to constrict even further in the economy before turning the corner to the second half of the year and seeing economic recovery starting then. And you can see uh, four out of the five um, financial institutions are saying in the third quarter, we should see positive economic activity. And five of the five are saying in the fourth quarter, we should see positive economic activity. So. A lot of question about, you know, is it a U shape? Is it a V shape? Is this going to be a W shape or a check? A lot of, a lot of you know, different terms have been used, but suffice it to say, experts are calling for recovery and economic growth to start happening again uh, in the second half of the year. And as we look at that, I want to bring back in another quote um, from Morgan Stanley, the chief investment officer. And she says, we believe that the U.S. economy is set for a U or even a V-shaped recovery where economic activity will bottom perhaps very soon and then recover steadily. So we're looking at the overall economy um, and, and believing it to kind of, you know, this ride down, whether you call that a V or a U, and then 
once we hit the bottom to, to begin to, to grow and expand again. And the question I think we have in our business right now is how will that affect housing and how will that, you know, uh, what role will housing play, housing play there? And, and I brought another quote in from Data Tree from uh, First American. And they say the U.S. housing market has proven to be incredibly resilient in the face of recent pandemics. So in this study, they went back and uh, studied different uh, SARS, H1, uh, you know, type flus, H1N1, N2. And history suggests the housing market is likely to fare better throughout pandemics and recover more quickly than the overall economy. Okay, and, that's and, good and, to know. Yeah, and, and I think CNBC came out and said, you know, there's evidence brewing that home buyers may be coming back to the market after demand plummeted in the past month, really, due to coronavirus. Now, this was an article written where we were seeing a, an increase in mortgage applications specifically to purchase. But let's take a dive into, into a little bit more data and look at some things that can be leading indicators for our market uh, the real estate market to say, okay, what's what's going to play out here? The first I want to use is a graph from Showing Time, and this is up to date showing um, where we've been in this country relative to showings. Now across the country, those are happening either physically in some cases, virtually in others, maybe a combination of both. But we took this hard dive down the first of of March, bottomed out really, you know, and then have slowly seen this climb back up. Uh, in in showings and people saying, hey, now that we are, are you know starting to get through this, we can safely maybe go look at a house, whether that's virtually in person or whatever it is, um, and and get back to the need we had to buy a home, sell a home that didn't go away during the coronavirus. And so, and, and uh, this is this is via showing time. And, and again, correct. Uh, David, most of our uh, viewers are in the real estate industry and understand showing time. But for those that aren't, because we do have some people watching that aren't necessarily in real estate, yeah. showing time is a is a company that real estate agents, when, when they want uh, to see a home, um, they will go through a service called showing time. And there's others out there, but showing time is collected data uh, from the agents that uh, schedule showings through their service. It's an app and um, it, it's recognized by many brands and many MLSs in many states. And I, I actually looked across uh, Illinois, I think showings are down 10% compared to last year at this time. Yeah. Uh, but, but three weeks ago, a month ago, you know, they were down 50, 60%. So we're definitely seeing an upride, uh, you know, here in Illinois and across the country as well. And that's what this, this is showing us. Yeah, yeah, great call out there. And while we're not back probably across the country to where we you know, would be this time of year, definitely are seeing uh, this growth happening and uh, from where the bottom was in, in showings. Another thing we can look at, uh, this is from a realtor.com uh, survey, new listings, knit listings being taken are increasing and starting to show pick up there as we go through uh, the weeks here in May. So, so we can look at that. Showings are up. Uh, people are saying, okay, now we, we may want to list our home uh, and put it on the market, you know, uh, to, uh, to, be, to be available for somebody to look at. And then I'll, I'll, I'll show one more slide before I, I pause the, the screen sharing here. Uh, Zillow just released that new listings and pending sales are also increasing week over week uh, as of May 12th. So we're, we're seeing growth. Uh, week over week in pending sales, those that are going into contract that somebody's you know decided to, to purchase a home, and, uh, and and they're agreeing with Realtor.com here saying okay, we're seeing listings pick up as well. So suffice it to say, and I'll and I'll pause sharing for just a minute here that you know experts are saying Michael that we you know should see growth economically speaking in the second half of the year, and I think we're starting to see real estate help lead the way out of that. So that's very, very encouraging for, for our business right now. Yeah, no, that's great to see. So again, real estate comes down to supply and demand. And so mm -hmm. when there's limited supply that's on the market and you are seeing more and more buyers looking, you know, A, those are higher quality buyers. You're not seeing as many tire kickers go out during COVID-19 because of the increased, you know, uh, you know, hoops to jump through, right? And, right. and, and, and uh, you know, in Illinois, for example, um, you know, a lot of companies are requiring certain disclosures that buyers fill out, you know, 
uh, they're supposed to put booties on and wear gloves and masks. So again, that's a that's a more serious buyer if they're looking today in May, uh, David versus last May, perhaps. Absolutely, and I, and I think what we're seeing too across the the. Um, uh, the country, you know, you mentioned showing time, which we look to to say, okay, what is happening with people scheduling showings? Uh, Michael Lane, who's the CEO of that company, had a quote in one of his recent uh, updates, and he said, really, this shows in the real estate ba- uh, business innovation being birthed out of all the pain over the last couple of months. To your point, Michael, figuring out how can we get back to transacting or selling homes in a safe way, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in depending on where you're at in the country, there are different requirements to be able to do that and do it safely. And I think it's not, it's just not, it's not just our business doing that. There are many businesses right now saying, how can we open up, but do it in a safe way where we don't endanger people or the spread hopefully of uh, the coronavirus. And so I think that's going to be something that we're going to look at. And that's a, you know, that's a hot topic, right? And, and many mm-hmm. people, you know, claim it's a political topic, right? Sure. I mean, certain states, you know, are, are, you hate to say red states, blue states, but, you know, if you look at the comparisons, um, you know, I'm, I'm based here in Illinois and, you know, that's pretty, it's pretty tight here, uh, although real estate's considered essential. So, you know, from that data that you're showing and people are, you know, the experts, JP and Morgan and, and some of the Golden Sachs, you know, looks like, um, third quarter and fourth quarter are, are going to be, uh, you know, positive and, and moving, you know, upwards. Sure. I, I'm interested to see, depending on state by state level, certain states, if they're more restrictive, you know, how does that affect those projections? Yeah, and we, we don't have the answer to that, but I think that's going to be, we deal in macro U.S. data, so we're looking at the whole there, but I right, think suffice right. it to say that you know, depending on the state, depending on what the regulations are, businesses in general are saying, you know, how do we, you know, to conduct business in the face of this and, 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 and really do it in a way that, that, uh, you know, is resilient, you know, is, is able to go, okay, now that we know that as a restaurant, you know, I was out this, this weekend doing something in a restaurant, had tables set up outside uh, near our home, you know, there are things that, 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 that slowly, you know, different businesses will be able to do to get sure. things going in. And real estate's no different than that. And, and, and where are you based again, personally? Uh, in Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia. Okay, yeah. very good. And, and, and we're still in a phase one, you know, kind of to, yeah. to the point that, uh, that, that you mentioned. Yeah, good. All right, so so the first question we talked about, when's the, uh, the, the economy going to recover? And a lot of projections are, you know, third and fourth quarter, you're going to see things pick up. Um, so that's... That's good. Uh, the second question that you had some good visuals on and, and data, is this going to be 2008 all over again? Sure, yeah. Let me share the screen and we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that real quick. On, and it's a question I think a lot of us have uh, in that because, you know, what we remember a lot of times is 2008 and, and the, you know, just the impact it had on uh, the housing market, housing values, all that. So the team, the research team at KCM went back and compared this market to 2008. And there's some interesting things I think uh, you, you, you'll, you'll want to see here. So the first place I want to start here is in home price appreciation. So you can see here the, the graph on the left represents the six years leading up to the housing crash. And on the right are the six years leading up to today. And you can just visually see the appreciation back then was much higher than what it has been leading up to today. 12% in 2004, 12.5%. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Really, I would say at that point, Michael, we had runaway appreciation in this country. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, and, you know, when I say that, I think about maybe a Western movie that you're watching and you hear there's a runaway train coming towards town. And and what you know is is next something bad's about to happen. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Uh, you know, we certainly know something bad happened uh, in the housing market, where our business was at the center of the downturn uh, in the housing crash. So, and today, you know, while we've had good appreciation for the last six years, we don't have it to the degree that we had back then. And, and really, that that runaway appreciation led to the, a lot of the issues that we had uh, and we saw in the housing crash. So, just real quick calculation, you know, probably about five between five and five and a half percent the last year uh, is the average uh, versus the six years leading up to the, the, the crash in 2007, eight, you're looking at nine and a half to 10 percent. So almost, almost double. Yeah. Yeah. You can even notice here in 2017, the highest year 
in the last six years, not even equal to the lowest year. Good point. Uh, in, in 2001. So big, big difference there relative yeah. to appreciation. You, you mentioned the, the, the comparison between, uh, to, between the markets relative to supply. Uh, and, and this really, this picture kind of, kind of tells a story. If you look back in 2008, you can see that uh, there were, depending on the time, 10 or 11 months of supply of inventory. Now, what we would say there is using this neutral or balanced market example of six months, maybe seven months uh, of, of a balanced market. Over that would be a buyer's market or literally there's an oversupply of homes uh, for the number of people that want to buy them. And, and under that is a seller's market, literally an undersupply. Of, of homes on the market. And we know back in 2008, we had an oversupply of homes, which then led to a lot of the, uh, the, the issues that we faced and, and where we sit today, even whether you're on here as, as an agent or somebody who, who is, um, you know, trying to buy a home there, there across the country aren't enough homes on the market for the number of people that want to buy them. Now that's going to you know, vary by price point yes, uh, in yes, a different that's... part in the country. Yeah, that definitely varies by price point. You know, one of the things that we teach agents, David, is, is you know, there's four primary price points to most markets. You got starter home or entry level, you got average mm -hmm. price, you got high end, which we define for our designation as two times the average sale price for that given market, and luxury home prices, which are three times the average sale price for that given market. And so in most markets, that upper 10% uh, of home prices you know, it's definitely more of a, right. a buyer's market, seven plus more months of inventory. So, so you're sh the data you're sharing is, is all sales, all transactions, how many Correct. months of inventory, uh, which is very helpful. Correct. And, and as you look across the country, generally speaking, less of that supply is on the lower end, Michael, you're right. And as, as we go up, there's more supply. But, but as we look at the volume of homes as well is going to be on the lower end. So that it, it you know, that undersupply will keep, you know, positive pressure on home prices this year. Um, and, uh, and another one of the reasons that we don't see a, you know, a depreciation uh, across the country in home values. And so this, this really tells the story of that across the country. Good, good data, good visual. So again, when there's seven or more months of inventory, we call that a buyer's market and home prices depreciate in a buyer's market. A balanced or neutral market is you know, around five or six months, home prices are steady. And you know, in this graph, it says less than six months. So four months or less is what we call a seller's market and home prices appreciate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's look at another key uh, you know, graphic here. And this is the total home equity that has been cashed out. Think about these as cash out refinances. In the three years leading up to uh, the housing crash, there were $824 billion cashed out as cash out refinances across the country uh, in homes. Really at that time, people harvesting equity from their homes, repositioning it into oftentimes depreciating assets, uh, maybe going on vacations, funding lifestyle, thinking this will never end. Yeah. And we know the three years leading up to today, while people are, are doing uh, cash out refinances, nowhere near uh, the number we saw leading up to uh, the housing crash. And it's interesting to, to look at the three years leading up to today is not even equal to one year leading up to 2008. Mm -hmm. And so in that, Michael, I think we can look at it and say there are a lot of lessons that uh, consumers learned in 2008 that they don't want to repeat again. And they're handling equity much differently today than back then. Yeah, good point. So, you know, home appreciation wasn't as, as steady, not as high. Uh, this time around versus 2008, that's the first point from the previous graph. And this graph talks about people aren't, you know, they're being smarter with their money. They weren't pulling equity out, whether it be for entertainment or buying investment properties or whatever it might be. They were keeping their equity in their home. Yep. Yeah. So, so let's take another look at equity real quick and, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pause the sharing real quick, but th this came out from John Burns Consulting, and this is a percentage of homeowner equity in 2020. So, so in that study, 42.1% of the homes in this country don't have a mortgage on them. 16.6% uh, of the homes in this country have greater than 60% equity, and you can go around the wheel and see 
uh, the remaining numbers as a percentage uh, of, of equity in the home. But suffice it to say that equity across the country is very, very strong uh, today. And, and it leads us to, to this, that we know 58.7% of the homes in this country have at least 60% equity. And like we talked about, 42.1% of the homes are owned free and clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then CoreLogic tells us, uh, and on the KCM blog today, we, we wrote about this, that the average of a home with a mortgage on it is $177,000 today. And so back in 2008, when you saw homes uh, lose value and depreciate, and again, nobody's calling for that right now, people literally at that point owed more on the home than it was worth and they walked away. Um, no, nobody's walking away from, from that kind of equity, $177,000. Or if it, again, if it, if it were to decrease in value, um, $150,000 or $125,000 in value uh, today. Okay. So very, very different things to look at in the market uh, today versus 2008 that we can, uh, we can kind of point to and, and what's going on with real estate. Good, good information. Very good information. Well, now, you know, the, the third question, we're talking about job losses, right? I think over 35, 37 million uh, Americans have filed for unemployment. Um, talk to me a little bit about what you think or what you're seeing out there as far as the, the effects that's going to have, not just on the economy, but also housing. Sure. So let me, let me kind of say a couple things. I mean, th this is a big story that our research team is watching, you know, each week. Um, changes weekly, right? <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we get that out. And so I'll go through a lot of that. Uh, we'll get the next month's uh, data coming in for May, you know, the first week of June. We've got April's information in now. Okay. But, but all of us want to see what is going to, what is going to happen there. So let me bring you... Uh, what, what we have here so we can kind of have that, uh, that conversation. So I'll start out with a couple of quotes here that I pulled. Uh, the first is from Ben Bernanke. Uh, he says, I don't find comparing the current downturn with the Great Depression to be very helpful. We've got a lot of people out there saying this is going to be as bad as the Great Depression. He says, the expected duration is much less and the causes are very different. So I, I, th I think we have to keep in mind that we're dealing here with a, with a health crisis, not a, you know, not a an internal financial crisis in the economy. And, uh, and, and in that's kind of what Ben Bernanke is saying there. The, the next I want to bring in is, uh, is, is from the Wall Street Journal, this quote. It says, news stories today often describe the coronavirus-induced global economic downturn as the worst since the Great Depression. You know, regarding unemployment, it says this is likely to be literally true, yet for many, the comparison does more to terrify than clarify. So let's kind of hop into that from a numbers perspective and look at that. Um, I mentioned before the April unemployment report that came out, we, we shot up to 14.7%. The prior month was 4.4%. Um, the, we know the first year or, or here in, that we're using in 1932 in the Great Depression, uh, the unemployment rate was 236 so that was for the year. We're talking here at 14.7 for the month. Now, we don't know how this year is going to play out with sure. that. Sure. And likely next month, that number is to go, uh, to go higher. But then as forecasts for unemployment go, it's, it's seeing decreasing over the next four years. I'm not saying the next year at 9% unemployment is not high, but it's certainly not 24.9% like 1933 in the Great Depression and so on, where we had four years back to back with over 20% unemployment. Yeah, and 9% and for you know projections for 2021, any kind of context as to, um, you know, 2008, what, what was that? And I'll what, get into that in just okay. a second. Perfect. I'm glad you asked that. So I'll, I'll show you that graphically here in just a minute. We'll, we'll compare those. Um, but, but here's a look at, at weekly filings. And so, you know, we, we started this out the end of March uh, and, and we shot up and we've slowly come down each week of people that are filing for unemployment benefits. Um, and, and, you know, the, the latest 2.9 million people uh, filing for unemployment. I, I'm not certainly not saying that is a that is a good number, but it's not 6.9 million. Sure, and, sure. Uh, and, and hopefully that number continues to decrease. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's give a little context to who in the Latin April unemployment report, which is the largest one that we've had to look at and uncover numbers from our team 
uh, of what makes that up. So this is a breakdown of who lost their jobs in that unemployment report. And, and what you can see on the left side, the, the majority, 37.6% of those people are people in the restaurant business. Servers, bartenders, people that are, um, that, that are in that business. And, uh, and we certainly know wherever we live and, and across this country that restaurants have uh, taken a big hit in, in this downturn. Um, we see there that 10.2% that in two categories, retail and temporary services. Retail, you know, malls, people that are, that are in that retail business, and then temp services, literally the temp industry um, uh, uh, being heavily, uh, you know, affected by this uh, shutdown. You go next to this, this kind of blue area, doctor's offices. These are all... Um, uh, you know, pediatricians, dentists, things that we know are coming back, things that didn't go away uh, during this downturn. Uh, arts and entertainment, we're going to watch that one to say, okay, what, you know, what is going on there? How quickly will that go back? Um, manufacturing, manufacturing jobs, you know, how quickly are they coming back? Um, Childcare, we know we want those people back. Yeah, uh, we yeah, need them yeah. back to be able to work, you know, and we'll, and we'll likely even pay them more for that. Um, a whole new respect for uh, uh, stay at home, as well as a whole new respect for those that uh, homeschool their kids, right? Absolutely, yeah. For teachers, you know, uh, yeah. in the in the hard work that they do, and and you can see and you can see on here construction jobs. We know we started this year strong in construction, and and expect that to you know to continue on. Um, hotels here. There's I'll a big question. That's a surprise to me, the hotels. I thought that would be a lot higher. I mean, I, I, I'm next to a Marriott in my offices and, yeah. you know, there, don't see any cars over there. The, the, you know, there, there are a lot of questions on the service industry in general, you know, areas where we, you know, oftentimes spend, spend discretionary income uh, of being heavily hit in this, uh, in this downturn. Mm -hmm. So, um, a lot of questions about that. But that gives you a sense of the breakdown of who lost their jobs. Uh -huh. so, so let's let's take a look at that. Um, and, and I want to bring in a quote from First American from the chief economist there. It says, our analysis shows that the nature of this service sector driven recession is unlikely to result in a one to one decline in home ownership uh, demand because those being impacted disproportionately by this recession are much less likely to have been house hunting in the first place. So really what she's saying there is the people that have been largely um, affected by this um, were not house hunting in the first place. That, that's not to diminish them and say that they aren't affected. That's not real because they are. Um, but to draw that out uh, relative okay. to how will that affect real estate. Okay. Um, we, we know also that this report here from the Wall Street Journal that the job loss has been greater for lower income households. This is a percentage of uh, households that lost at least one job uh, in their income. And, you know, under 40,000, over 40% 40 of those people uh, have lost a job. And you can see it across there. So disproportionately um, affecting lower income uh, households right now. And I want to bring back in and kind of and kind of wrap maybe this data up on that question that you asked. How does this compare to uh, the Great Recession or the Great Depression? So this is a graph. It's a projection of unemployment now and what we have factored against the Great Recession and Great Depression from where we started. How long did it take to get back to where we were? And so this shows us shooting up. This is a Goldman Sachs projection, which I would say is the most uh, dire projection, meaning we go the highest uh, in what they're saying, which I believe is 25% here in unemployment. And then we would return to where we were before by the fourth year. So that the, there are a lot of people saying different things. That's probably the most uh, dire projection. Okay. Well, in the Great Recession, that took nine years, but in the Great Depression, it took 12 years. So really looking at depth of recession over the length of recession and uh -huh. length is much more important than depth in, in what we look at helps you really kind of see, okay, what's the difference between today, 2008, and then ultimately the great depression. Good information. Yeah. So it, 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 a lot of questions to be answered about unemployment. Our team is going to stay on top of that. Um, and a lot of people being affected by this, but, but our hope is as we begin to, you know, um, there's been a, a lot of analogies to threading the needle, 
meaning bringing businesses back up online safely, um, that these people and, and many people can get back to work as that starts to happen. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Good information. Um, th the fourth thing that we're gonna talk about is the biggest threats, right? So we've talked a lot about um, indirectly threats, right, with COVID-19, but let's talk about the biggest threats in, in, in the housing recovery as well as the, the job recovery and the economic recovery. Sure, yeah, so the, so the biggest threat really in housing is I'll share this, uh, this quote here from the Z report. It says, we note that inventory as a percent of households, again, across the country sits at the lowest level ever. And to kind of illustrate this point, I'll bring in a couple of quick uh, charts and, uh, and, and show that to you. The first is uh, March buyer traffic, and this is re released by NAR um, most recently. It's the most recent data we have. And, and you can see in March, even as, as we're starting the crisis, that, that buyer traffic across the country has been strong to stable. The dark blue represents strong buyer traffic. The light blue represents stable buyer traffic. There's a gray in there for weak and you don't see any weak buyer traffic. And so what we know is we know buyers are out in the market. They're looking for homes to buy. But if we, if we look at the seller traffic as compared to that, and we start with February, we see we started across the country and primarily Southern states with you know, seller, seller traffic starting to appear. What's that? By seller traffic, do you mean uh, the number of listings that are currently out there? Correct. Yeah. Listings okay. coming online, sellers uh, being out there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that stabilizing, starting to happen, getting ready for a, um, the spring market. We see a couple of states where that's strong. And then what we know in March relative to seller traffic is it just fell off the map. Um, it, it went away where people said, hey, look, we, we, we don't want to sell our home right now. We may have a fear of, of come people coming in our home. And so the, the biggest threat we have right now as a business is, we have a lot of people who want to buy homes. We just don't have the, 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 the listings for those folks to, to be able to, 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 to find a home to purchase. Uh, and That's good news if you're purchase. selling, not if you're buying, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So uh, very interesting to look at that across the country as we, you know, as we get ready for, you know, the, the summer potentially across the country being the, you know, the spring market. Yeah, yeah, and that's the conversation I had last week, you know, in the Chicagoland market that if you were to say, what are the four primary months, you know, it's March, April, May, June. And yeah. so here we are, we've, we've missed out on two of those months. And so I have a $2 million seller that's thinking about, do I put it on next year? Or, you know, do I put it on this year and the prime season's in a rear view mirror? And, and we're hoping that everything just gets pushed back a little sure. bit, right? Sure. And, and I think we may be seeing some of that in some of the showing time data, some of the, you know, things now starting to pick up. Because, because listen, if you were thinking about buying or selling a home and this happened, that didn't change. Maybe for some people that they said, well, we're going to wait or, or put it off if they can. Sure. But if there was a life event, if there was something that was causing them uh, to, to have that need, that didn't go away. Mm -hmm. Good, good. All right. And the last thing we're going to talk a little bit about is um, what what do agents need right now brokers need right now um, as far as you know to 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 be on the mend right to to take their business upwards yeah yeah so let me let me kind of start there and we will um uh, we'll kind of kind of wrap this time up talking about that and, and so you know, you know what do we need to do right now it's a question i'm going to give you four things that i think will help you and, and hopefully these slides will help as well uh, the first is right now, as we're communicating with people, make your message simple and effective. You know, really using at KCM, the Keeping Current Matters, we like to say simple and effective, where you can see a chart or a graph and you can see the difference between today and 2008. You can see a chart or graph and you can say, okay, I understand what's going on with this particular subject. And, and, and really doing that locally, showing, hey, this is what's happening right now. Here are pending sales where we're at. Here's what's happening with listings where we're at. Um, it's gonna help people more, more than ever right now. The, the second piece is remain hyper current on all your housing information right now. Things are changing quickly. You know, we've come out of this 60 day period where most of the country was on lockdown. Things are starting to change now and, you know, uh, states are opening back up and, and hopefully doing that safely. But Remaining hyper current on housing information through this uh, this time is going to be critical 
uh, as you get that message out there. Next, make your mix your micro data, meaning your local data, with the with the macro or U.S. data that uh, that I've just showcased here. I'm talking about what's happening right now inside your market, going into your MLS, getting that data out of there, and saying, "Hey, here's what we're seeing happen locally here uh, with the homes that uh, that are for sale that are going on the market. Transactions are happening, whatever the case may be." And last use videos uh, on social media and in Zoom meetings. You know, I think we've all been told for the last couple of years we need to be on video and, and now we've got to be on video. Uh, we, we've got to be able to deliver this message via video to the people that we serve and, uh, and, and really, you know, kind of kind of get the message out there and, and technology and video is probably the best way today to do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, yeah. That, that's a good point. That's a good point on all four of those. I, I, one could argue, you know, that those four points, you know, could be main four points uh, six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, uh, but even in a, even more so in an unknown economy, uh, unknown housing market. You know, keep your message simple. Use great visuals. Know the local numbers as well as trends. Right, that's really important. And then. And then video, uh, that's yeah. you know, really, yeah. really a good point. I, I think, you know, um, we're seeing people, you know, everybody, let's say that you've talked to that's thinking about selling a home or, you know, coming into the spring, put them on a Zoom meeting and talk to them and saying, this is what's happening. This is, they're buyers out in the market, right? Anybody that's thinking about buying, hey, here's what's happening. You know, you know get these groups of people together and be able to, you know, to show them, here's what's going on in our market. Here's what's happening nationally. Because I'll go back to the quote that we used before. Most of the headlines that people are reading now are, are you know, built to uh, terrify rather than clarify, to quote the Wall yeah. Street Journal there. Yeah. The, the job of media or TV is to get you to watch more TV. Yeah. And so being able to, to deliver the truth is what we've got to do in today's market. No, that, that's spot on, David. I tell agents all the time. I garbage in garbage and people say out oh. I say no garbage in garbage stays right so right. so much negativity negativity and life is what drives real estate and and I think during this shelter in place time uh, people are taking a hard look at their current floor plans and their house to determine hey if, if, a, if a second flare-up comes or what's really important in a house and I think that's also going to drive people uh, you know from the cities and downtown Chicago yeah. with vertical living and common uh, you know, foyers and, and, and elevators and work out where they want their own, uh, as well as, you know, maybe two home offices and, and various things like that. that. That $2 million seller I was telling you about, he's got an amazing indoor pool and he's thinking about waiting till next year to put it on. I said, right now with all the public pools that are going to be closed in the Chicagoland market, that's e even more a desirable feature right. uh, than it, it was six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. Right. No, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, being able to get that message out today, like we can to talk to people about, hey, here is exactly what's happening in our markets. Here is what, you know, people are doing. Here's what people are saying. Being able to show a, a home on on Zoom, you know, and, and show it to many people uh, is, is very advantageous. And it's something that we wouldn't have probably thought about now. But, you know, now that we, we know we can do that, right. I think some of that stuff will, will remain and, and, and folks will be able to, to preview a home that way. You know, the, the other thing is, is just you mentioned the, the desire, right? The case, if, if you're not following a KCM blog, I'd encourage you to, you don't have to be a member of Keeping Current Matters just to go to KCM blog and get that in your inbox every day. But on Thursday of last week, we wrote an article about a new Harris poll that confirms that idea that um, I believe that in that in that article, 39% of the people that were surveyed that lived in an urban environment said, you know what, now we're considering going to a little more suburban environment. And so whether it's the point that you make about we've just spent the last 60 days in our, our home and we now have a list of everything we would change, we would downsize, we would you know, we would upsize whatever it is, or we want a backyard, or we want this or that. Right. Um, I think you're seeing things that people go, you know what, I didn't think that was important to me, but now it is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just saw uh, Glenn uh, Kelman from Redfin. He was interviewed talking about what they're seeing on their website as far as, you know, he definitely s sees a major shift in major cities um, that, you know, now that maybe people are realizing they can work from home and maybe certain businesses are going to be more 
lax with that, right. uh, that you might see a shift in, in, in more, you know, suburban areas um, versus, you know, the city. So um, really, really good information. Um, I'm going uh, to tie this up, you know, for those of you that are in real estate, you know, as David mentioned, Keeping Current Matters, it goes by KCM. Uh, they have amazing free content out there on their blog, but they also have a, a, a great um, feature for members and it's only $25 a month where it's, it's, it's statistical data, great visuals that you can work with, uh, use when you're working with buyers, sellers, potential clients, invest, investors, and it's more macro, but I'm a big believer in having the macro because you, you get your finger on the pulse and, and, and where, what's trending and where things are coming, but you also have to know your local micro numbers as well. And, um, you know, that, that's really important to become that local a neighborhood expert, so to speak. Um, and so uh, you can go to trykcm.com forward slash luxury, trykcm.com forward slash luxury for a two week trial or check them out. What, what's the best place for them to find uh, the, the blog? Uh, is that just? Um, yeah, so you, you can go to the, you can go to trykcm.com forward slash luxury. There's a link to the blog perfect. there. You can check perfect. that out. Yep. And uh, yeah, we, we'd love to have you on the, um, the journey with us, if uh, if it's right for you, I'm going to give all these slides to you, Michael, so you can Perfect. give them out to anybody who wants those. Awesome. Use these to help people right now. You know, that's yeah. what we want to give them to you for. Is as, as people have these questions, use these to help answer those questions. Very good, very good. A wealth of information. Appreciate your time today, David. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting us on. And as always, however we can help, uh, you know, we believe now more than ever it it, it matters. You know, to, to stay current. Yeah, no, appreciate it. Appreciate it. And uh, any questions? I mean, I'm just going to check to see if there's any questions. And if not, uh, same time, same place on Wednesday and Friday of this week. We already got May booked up and we're halfway booked up for June already. We're really excited about, uh, you know, the, the feedback, the direction. If you guys know of anybody that you think would be an amazing contributor, please, by all means, we're, we're, we're open to uh, suggestions. So um, don't have any questions right now, but I really okay. appreciate your time, David. You're very thorough you with your it. visuals. And uh, guys, have a great Monday. Have a great week. Uh, keep proving others wrong and keep making other people's day. My name is Michael Lafito. Take care. Thanks again, David. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.